Okay, um, good afternoon everyone for some of them and um, we would like to, my name is Roma Murin, uh, Program Director at Connection Schools. Uh, I'm happy to moderate today Connection School Talk, which will consist of a series of four presentations, followed by a short presentation and Q&A with the audience. I would like to mention that all our speakers actually are contribut contributors to the second edition of Connection Magazine LEN. Uh, title Land and Ziemia in Ukrainian, which has been released today, uh, like literally 30 minutes ago, and it's available on our website, so please feel free uh, to see it. Um, but let me first, before we start, introduce our speakers. So the first, uh, our speaker will be Annie Schneider. She's architect, writer, and researcher based in Rotterdam. Her recent work appears in the countryside, the future, at the Salomon Guggenheim in New York. And the next speaker will be Levka Maria Danker, uh, which is architect and critical thinker based in Copenhagen. Uh, she's currently working in the field of sustainable urban planning for the office uh, named Everyday Studio. The uh, third speaker is Tadeas Riha, is uh, architect and writer based in London. Uh, he's co-author of Steel Cities, the architecture of logistics in Central and Eastern Europe. And based on that book, he also contributed as a different version, contribute to our magazine. And the last speakers in uh, Jean Yunot and Bojana Papic are architects and urban planners and researchers based in Zurich. They are founders of Luftschloss Collective, its interdisciplinary design collective. So we will host Q&A afterwards, so please feel free to write all the questions on our uh, connection website in the chat, and we will read them after all the presentation. So maybe I will give the voice to Annie to start with her presentation. Thank you, Romeo, for the introduction. I'm excited to speak with such a diverse group today about something that's actually very personal to me and uh, initially seems to be a little bit outside of the post-socialist countryside team, but I saw many connections as I was working on this, and um, I think you will too as I start. So I will get going here. Uh, can you see my presentation? We also With see the notes, you. maybe, yes. Oh, all right. Let me try one more time. Sorry. <laughs> and now, is it okay? Okay. So two years ago, I went home to California for a few months due to visa issues. Um, uh, due to visa issues, and I went on a road trip with my mom. My article focuses on one part of this trip, the Imperial Valley and the Salton Sea. The areas we visited and that I spent the last few years investigating as a contributor to the countryside show, I'd always thought of as something to be driven through as quickly as possible or preferably flown over. Uh, I'm going to assume that the aerial image of middle America, known as the flyover states, is familiar to most of you. It's where the Jeffersonian grid is at its most visible, its most blatant, and its shaping of the American countryside the most obvious. But the same grid covers 70% of the continental US. In some places so faint it's practically subliminal, but it's there, the largest grid in the world. 
the land ordinance of 1785, Jefferson's grid, was a Cartesian projection that parceled the vast expanses of the Western territories, sight unseen, into six square mile townships, 640 acre parcels, and 160 acre lots. The Homestead Act of 1862 was the means of clearing and cultivating the wilderness and of populating those squares with people, specifically farmers, with the goal of creating an agrarian democracy that stretched from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Its unstoppable westward trajectory was not only righteous, but preordained. It was called manifest destiny. You'll notice that as I'm talking, I'm using imperial units, acres and miles. And that's because these numbers, 640, 160, 40, have assumed a numerological significance in the American psyche on par with seven in the Bible. The grid is America's creation myth. God had seven days and the American homesteader had 160 acres. The grid prefigures, it assumes as a default condition, uninhabited terrain, blankness, emptiness and flatness. Of course, we know that's false. And that's why I call it a creation myth. Um, it, has a, it was a two-dimensional survey system imposed on a three-dimensional world. A single stroke of the surveyor's line amputated rivers and mountain ranges and decimated indigenous populations. It was a tool of erasure as much as creation. It was an ideological projection and the countryside as much as any building or monuments is always inscribed by the political, whether it's communism, socialism, capitalism, or feudalism. The country Jefferson's grid was intended for and was supposed to create doesn't exist. The grid outlived its initial purpose for parceling homesteads out to farmers and American settlers. These farmers moved to the suburbs and a nation of producers has become a nation of consumers. But the grid remains. It was and is ultimately a speculative armature, a tool of expansion, commerce, and control, a flexible matrix equally suited to developers, big banks, and big business as to the now defunct dream of an agrarian democracy. The grid, by disregarding the reality of the land and its original occupants, did achieve on paper a very American idea of equality or at least equivalency. It announced that every square pixel of land would and could be cultivated, made to produce, and made to profit, regardless of terrain or climatic conditions. The Southwest, where we'll be focusing, is an inhospitable swath of desert, the land least suited for cultivation, and it's where the grid's true nature is revealed. It is America's back of house, where things that are too big, too ugly, and too distasteful happen. Land the US government was giving away to homesteaders as recently as the 1970s is now an industrialized infrastructure of solar farms, feedlots, monoculture, irrigation canals, and highways. It is manifest destiny's end of the line. Imperial County, where we're focusing, is a complex ecosystem. A swirling Cartesian vortex of big box retail, feedlots, solar farms, ice border control checkpoints, drainage ditches and train tracks. Everything here is on its way somewhere else. An unstoppable flow of commerce that moves in the L-shaped path of a night on a chessboard. Water, energy, crops, and long haul truckers all slide along the X and Y axes of America's grid. To get there, we took the 10 freeway, which stretches from the Pacific to the Atlantic, or in the parlance of manifest destiny from sea to shining sea. We pass signs that caution us not to pick up hitchhikers near the prison, to be aware of poisonous snakes and insects, and declare brush fire level high. On our map, we see towns, collections of buildings with names like Mirage, Siberia, and Baghdad, a nod to both the climate and the extreme remoteness. It's 9 a.m. and already well over 37 degrees. We're in the Sonoran Desert, the sunniest place in the United States, which is also the largest alfalfa growing region in the world. Alfalfa is a kind of hay used to feed dairy cows. It's also called forge. And the fields we see are irrigated by an improbable muddy trickle of the hyper-controlled, over-allocated Colorado River, carried to the Imperial Valley through the desert by 2,500 kilometers of the All-American Canal. The Imperial Irrigation District, made up of Imperial Valley, home to all that hay, consumes 20% of the river's total supply. California is the most populous state in the US, 
home to over 33 million people, but these fields consume three quarters of the state's total river water allotment. And even more shockingly to me, they receive twice as much water as the entire country of Mexico. Throttled by thousands of kilometers of concrete channels, levees and dams, the Colorado River is amputated right at the Mexican border. While goods and capital are free to flow, people and water are brutally stymied on either side. The river rarely reaches its natural termination point in the Gulf of California, located in Mexico, depriving millions of a water source they once relied on and decimating a thriving ecosystem. Between one third and one half of the alfalfa grown in the Imperial Valley, irrigated by the dwindling river, is exported abroad to Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, China, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and ironically, to Mexico. China, the UAE, and many of the other countries that import alfalfa from the American Southwest either explicitly forbid or don't allocate land for the growing of animal feed due to climate concerns and lack of water. But this parched stretch of desert is a loophole. 12,000 acres of land here is owned by a Saudi Arabian company and the number one exporter of animal feed in the US is an Emirati company with farms in the Imperial Valley. This landscape has been emptied out and op optimized, parceled and sold. Any feature that doesn't contribute to increase yields or profit has been erased, including a social and, and environmental conscience. The grid persists, a smooth conduit of global supply and demand. The only metric, the only rubric, of the grid success is productivity. But there are unintended consequences to this drive for systematicity and extra large organization. There are errors, glitches in the matrix, places and people that refuse to be cultivated or produced, which brings us to the second part of my lecture. An aerial view of the Imperial Valley shows us a large body of water surrounded by farms, which isn't unusual, except in this case, it's the farms that created the lake and not the other way around. The causality is reversed. The Salton Sea is the largest body of water in California, and it's an accident of in the grid ambition. It's a form of liquid Prometheanism because in the desert, you steal water, not fire. Before 1902, this was a desolate stretch of desert. The survey grid of 1852, just a sketch in the sand. But that all changed when the canals, dug by private developers, brought water from the Colorado River. For a brief shiny moment, the desert bloomed. The settlers came in droves. Thousands of hectares of agricultural land were cultivated and trade tracks were laid down. This was a Jeffersonian success story, proving that even the most desolate and wasted square of sand could be cultivated. But those canals, the ancestors of today's complex irrigation system flooded in 1905. The Colorado River hemorrhaged into the Imperial Valley, which lies 70 meters below sea level. The accounts read like an Old Testament plague. A wall of water 10 miles wide washed away everything in its path. Snakes fled the flood and infested the surrounding settlements in a reversal of St. Patrick's legend. Thousands of fish carried by the waters putrefied in the desert sun, a vicious olfactory assault that could be smelled for miles. It took two years to finally corral the runaway river, but even after that, the Salton Sea remained. This accident led the federal government to step in and take over management of waterways, creating things like the Hoover Dam. And it led to a calibration of the nation's infrastructural grid. But the sea couldn't be assimilated and could not be made to be productive. But that wasn't for lack of trying. As soon as the sea formed, speculation began. Would-be fishermen and hoteliers stock the water with fish and imported sea lions, which either died or disappeared. It was a short-lived naval base and a speedboat time trial site. And in the 1950s, leisure resorts, yacht clubs, and golf courses sprang up around the newly branded California Riviera. It became for a brief time, a desert mirage vacation destination for LA urbanites. But today it's a ghost town of thwarted ambitions and an eerie desolation of semi-abandoned motels and trailers. But despite the heat and an average rainfall of less than eight centimeters a year, the lake remains, fed by a continual supply of agricultural runoff from American, Emirati, and Saudi Arabian owned alfalfa farms. As the water slowly evaporates, natural salt deposits and agricultural chemicals remain. Festering in the sun, it's getting saltier and more toxic by the day, a public health crisis and the few surviving fish doing an agricultural runoff are nothing short of miraculous. 
65 kilometers long and 24 kilometers wide, the Salton Sea is the Colorado River's final resting place. It's the river's backwash. And in the absence and disappearance of natural wetlands like the Gulf of California, it has become an unlikely yet vital ecosystem. The sea, which resisted every human attempt at cultivation, an environment so extreme that any life seems improbable, has become a crucial stopover for migratory birds and home to one of the most diverse avian populations in the continental US. Born of obsessive productivity and shameless speculation, all the ingredients of the grid gone horribly awry, the Sultan sees an extra large accident that refuses to evaporate, a glitch in the matrix that's neither wholly natural nor wholly man-made. And the sea resists the grid's imperative of productivity and continues to refuse definition. And in this small patch of desert, it isn't alone. 15 minutes away, we pass through the delusionally named town of Neeland, Nile land, and continue down a soft dirt road with no Google Street View to Slab City, and Salvation Mountain marks the entrance. It's a cartoonish idea of an LSD trip made out of adobe and latex paint. Covered in ecstatic religious verse, it's the St. Peter's of the Mojave, a roadside curiosity so far from the nearest road that it's not really a pit stop, but a pilgrimage. A mecca for Instagram influencers and road trippers. Just behind it, Slab City is less welcoming. Named for the empty slabs of the dismantled Camp Dunlap, a literal concrete grid laid down by the World War II era war machine. It has been slowly inhabited, encrusted, and calcified with trailers and tents. 640 acres of homestead land that nobody wanted, it's now home to the homeless. Homeless. Wealthy retirees, aged hippies, army veterans, Christian fundamentalists, burners and dropouts, all park on the remnants of the Marine Corps base where General Patton drilled and the Enola Gay flu practice runs before becoming the first aircraft to drop an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Officially, Slab City doesn't exist. Like its residents, it's fallen through the cracks. There's no water, no mail, no electricity, no garbage collection, no municipal services of any kind. There are supposedly also no laws, no taxes, and no foreclosures. Its residents call it the last free place. Jefferson spliced this legal loophole right into the DNA of the grid. Slab City is cited on section 36, the township parcel designated for public education Surveyed but never settled, federal, state, and local authorities all turn a blind eye to one of the longest lived squats in American history. It has existed now for almost 70 years. Its population fluctuates from less than 100 during the sweltering summer months to over 1,000 at its peak. In July, the whole place has an air of abandonment. Everyone who could leave has already left, but in winter, the population swells with retirees looking for a free place to park they're more expensive RVs. Club City is definitely the last free place to park your RV and maybe the last free place period. It's an unintentional community held together by a legal loophole and neglect. There's no cohering ideology or faith or belief. It doesn't produce, it maintains. It's an off-grid accident. Which is the point I wanna make with this story and these examples is that threaded through the extra large organizational framework of the country, the survey grid that divided the West before we'd ever seen it, are places and people that to this day resist cultivation, organization, and the grid's imperative of productivity. I haven't decided if this is a hopeful story or a pessimistic one. I like that there are accidents, that the grid isn't smooth and fully functional, that there are still free places and fill in the blank spaces. I also wonder for how long these off the grid hiccups will be allowed to exist. The grid exerts a smoothing and sedative effect. Slab City now posts um, rooms to stay in on Airbnb and the runoff that feeds the salt and sea is gradu gradually decreasing as irrigation becomes more efficient. But I'm sure these are not the only examples and I'd like to know what other kinds of accidental ecosystems the grid will and can create. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annie. So Lefke, I would like to uh, invite you as the next one. Yes. Okay. I'm gonna...
so this is my presentation. Um, can you hear me? Can you get up? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Super. Um, uh, has a very um, has a somehow a similar uh, connotation to what you talked about, but in a very abstract way. Um, but I'm just going to head on with my presentation, uh, which is actually also talking about property and also the how do you divide property in the rural air territories who actually owns the land. And uh, this is going to be in the context of hydropower developments in the Sunitian mountains. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to start here. Um, so I've been uh, to the Georgian mountains in 2016 to meet the locals in the mountains who are fighting actually against big hydropower developments in the area. And oh, sorry, my connection is not great. Um, so uh, I'm going to introduce two cases in the Svanitian mountains. One is uh, the Kodoni HPP, the other one is the Nenska HPP. Both of these HPPs, which are hydropower plants, are connected to the construction of two massive hydropower dams, which would flood about eight square kilometers of the valleys in the mountains. And it would probably lead to the uh, resettlement of about 14 villages in that area. And as you can see uh, on this map, Georgia has been focusing on hydropower development since the Soviet Union. Uh, and after the, yeah, after the uh, Rose Revolution, um, Saakashvili actually even uh, went further in his plans and focused on hydropower very ex in a very liberal and extreme way. And by 2017, he suggested more than 35 HPP development sites in Svaneti and made them available to global investors. So it became basically a uh, a chance for global investors to invest in Georgia and this caused a lot of problems in the local communities. I'm going to show the next slide. So for generations, swans have been living in exchange with their environment and they actually protected big parts of the Caucasus and kept it clean in a way that uh, there has been huge resources of clean water, clean air, uh, big uh, parts of the Caucasus have uh, an extremely interesting environment and natural uh, ecosystem. And yeah, the hydropower developments have caused uh, big impacts in terms of, for example, landslides, the humidity rise uh, has been rising. Uh, they had lots of construction problems, building hydropower dams and uh, yeah, so the local population is really afraid that more investments and more developments will force the mountains to crumble more and create, besides all the resettlement problems, even further problems in environmental context. And then we go to the next slide. The first case is the Kodoni Dam, uh, which is uh, located in the beginning of the road to Mestia, which is a famous tourist location in the mountains. Uh, the dam was originally planned during the Soviet Union times, and then they stopped constructing it actually because the environmental risks were too high, and activists convinced the, uh, the planners that it would not be a, yeah, a risk-free uh, investment. The problem was that in 2005, plans were resumed, um, even though it was not recommended by uh, the, the, uh, the, the companies who did the surveys of the area. So the community, Kaishi, actually became uh, so aware of the problem that they communicated with NGOs, for example, the Green Alternative and Bankwatch, to be able to communicate with the government, but also to be able to communicate with the investors and with the constructors, because the whole process turned out to be so not transparent that there was no possibility to actually raise the voices as locals. 
And uh, here you can see that the, uh, you can see on the left side, um, one of the houses in Kaishi, and on the right side, you can actually see houses of a community called New Kaishi. And this actually shows the trauma of the Soviet Union times when parts of the village had to be reset due to landslide problems while the construction of the dam was started, but also connected to landslides that were caused by a different hydropower dam, which is close by. And as you can see, people were relocated from the mountains to a desert in uh, near Tbilisi with no access to drinking water. And it was a completely different context. And you can see on the next slide, this is the graveyard. And the graveyard was extremely important to the Sunnitian population because they, they stay in contact with their ancestors through the graves and they have extremely important traditional and spiritual um, ceremonies. And you can see the big contrast from yeah, the graveyard in the mountains to the graveyard in the new Kaishi village. Um, and I'm going to go further. And this shows the problem of resettlement in that area because people or have no possibility to actually claim all the property they have and all the land that they use connected to also owning cattle, owning cows, owning pigs, having farmland. It creates this whole problem of unorganized resettlement, which is up to now not solved. There's no structural plan for these cases, how people will be resettled. Whereas during the Soviet Union time, at least they had villages where they would be uh, resettled to as a community, whereas now there's literally no, uh, no plan for these, uh, yeah, these circumstances. And as you can see on this diagram, a village is not only the houses, it is not only the property that is actually built on, it is so much more than, yeah, than what we can actually see, which is a, yeah. Uh, and here you can see, the whole valley which is which would be impacted by the hydropower dam so the gray area is basically what the contractors and the investment uh, investors bought but you can see that there are lots of little islands which are unregistered islands or unregistered land parts which officially belong to no one but they are in a very different system than the gray land that you can see so they're officially are not able to be sold, but they are in the reservoir site. So if one would make a proper observation of who owns the land, you can see that there are land parts that could actually be claimed not to be flooded, but because yeah, the majority of the land was sold to investors, it becomes kind of not enough to actually claim your voices or claim your rights of the land. And this has been a big problem after the, um, yeah, the dissolution of the USSR because big parts of the lands that were just not organized in a way that it was not redistributed to the people who were living in the local areas. And this way it became very vulnerable to very liberal approaches towards, uh, towards investments and towards uh, yeah, land rights. Um, so, and as you can see on this diagram, it shows two different areas. One is the red area here, and one is the gray area on the top of the, or in the higher parts of the Caucasus. And the gray area is actually protected by UNESCO. And this has to do with the, the physical appearance of defense towers, which became a very locative tourist attraction. Whereas in the areas which are red here, People did not have the need to build these towers back in the days, so they don't have a physical appearance of their culture and it is not seen as a, as a site for tourism to make money out of uh, or to create a business idea out of. So it has a very different, or the government has a very different approach to these areas because they can't really see on a, let's say, ignorant way, maybe, in an ignorant way, um, how to, yeah, profit from these areas. So it is kind of their argument to sacrifice these villages and these valleys to bigger investments. And this has been a big problem for many villages because just of the, the uh, economic, um, just in the economic context, they have nothing 
to provide to the government in terms of saying we are not uh, going to sacrifice this area because it is also profitable for you. So now NGOs actually try to make bigger plans of how to communicate with the government to actually convince and to, uh, to communicate the value of these areas to stop the development in these areas. And actually all, uh, I go back to the mess. Uh, yeah. Um, actually now through the uh, work together with the NGOs, all villages in this area started working together to, to, uh, to uh, create plans to work together in a more sustainable, also touristic approach. So they tried to spread out the tourism in the whole area and try to make plans that could actually show that this way would also be a more sustainable way of tourism to spread it out and not to have it concentrated in one area. Uh, and so that the, the money is basically spread over the whole village, but also that all areas are less prone to pollution and less prone to overcrowded uh, seasons in the summer. And this comes along with the more diverse energy plan, which is now first time also discussed in the government and in, in, yeah, meetings of the government to not only focus on hydropower, which is strongly connected to seasons, but also to focus on solar energy and wind energy and to basically take a step away from, uh, yeah, from one sided or like one-sided investments. Um, yeah, so this was my introduction to the and uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, Lepke. Thank you so much. Um, the next speaker is Tadas. If you can uh, start. Hello, everyone. I'll try to share my screen. Can you see the presentation? Hey, hello everyone. Thanks for the invitation. Um, my name is Tadaj Sriha and I'm going to be speaking here mostly as one of the editors of a book that just came out, uh, Steel Cities, um, which was published by Park Books and uh, the Prague Gallery uh, Viper, which we co-edited with Martin Špičák, uh, Katarina Freilachová, and Miroslav Pazdera. And um, most briefly, the book is about warehouses in the region of Central Europe, um, specifically in Czech Republic. Um, and we kind of approached the subject as um, something that is all around us, something that's universal in many ways, um, but something which is, at least in the Czech context, never really a destination in itself, either literally or more analytically. Um, and when it is, um, it's rarely a, a kind of a spatial subject. It's often spoken about in economic and social terms. And we, because we are all architects, we wanted to visit to kind of look at the phenomenon of, of logistics and warehouses development um, as a spatial phenomenon. Um, partly because in the Czech Republic, at least, uh, the logistics buildings take up up to one third of all construction that takes place a year. Um, so what we were kind of starting with was quite a trivial observation um, really one that only architects can make, that, that is that um, in the, um, that what st storing has to do with space um, and in the uh, kind of contemporary supply chain economics, what's interesting or what was interesting to us was that it's really difficult to find the border between production and manufacturing and logistics when the production process is broken down into all these very small fragments that no product or very rarely product is made in one place, but instead comes from all around the world. It's very difficult to, to say when a thing is being made and when a thing is being moved. And therefore we came up with this idea of looking at logistics as an industry um, and an industry of which the primary resource is space. 
Um, what's interesting then is that at least in Czech Republic, the warehouses are standardized to uh, a one height. That's uh, common for, for most uh, most of uh, the world actually. But um, it's, um, it's interesting then that if the warehouse sheds are all um, standardized height and so are the shelving systems, then we can kind of reduce the entity of space to its function, which is the land under these shelves, which is also the title of uh, my article. Uh, so the next question then obviously is what is in on these shelves? What is it that's being stored in these uh, warehouses that are, that are growing so fast in the East Central Eastern European landscape? And this is a quite a random photograph from an Amazon warehouse um, close to Prague actually. And um, it shows a few things. Um, not many of them are, some, some are new, some are old. Um, one thing they have in common is they, none of them are really um, intended for the Czech market. They're mostly intended for the German market. And this is a map that Martin, um, my, one of our co-editors co has made for the map, for, for the book is uh, showing, it's a European map showing different kind of performances um, of different regions, um, such as wages and, uh, and uh, values of rent, um, access to education and so on. The darker the blue, the kind of worse the prospects are. And you can see that Czech Republic being kind of wedged in West, into Western Europe, some of the regions that perform the worst are also those that are closest to Germany. And it is often in these regions that the warehouses are built, the, those that are meant for the um, markets abroad. Uh, it's a region that these regions would have really low wage, wages, really it would be much cheaper, of course, to build these storages, but then it, it, this is just um, a different way of kind of um, cultivating the, the resource of land just simply for its position on the European map. Um, and this is quite well understood by the logistics uh, parts developers. You can see that there is, uh, they're kind of focused uh, to, to a great extent to the northwest of Bohemia. So I'm not sure if you can also see my cursor or not. Um, and um, also the, the, the parks are also growing around the, the highways, of course, but at, at the same time, the, the, the region of northwest Bohemia, which is what we focused on, is where they are very prominent as well. Um, and uh, this is a photograph we had from a meeting with one of the developers. Um, and we always thought, and we're not the first ones to notice that, that there is something militaristic about the uh, logistics that um, the, the warehouses are placed on the European map from distance and from kind of distant headquarters. And in this case, this map quite literally is a magnetic board on which you place little magnets with these uh, new parks coming up. Um, and uh, this is another developer's homepage where you can almost imagine that maybe the developers wouldn't even visit the site of well, these so uh, many different locations they have all around the continent. Um, but uh, when these magnets do land in the landscape, uh, this is kind of what it looks like. I do admit that this is uh, slightly, uh, it's not the most favorable time that we came. This is in December. Uh, this is one of the um, parks that we looked at, uh, City Park Borg in, uh, in West Bohemia, uh, which is about uh, 400,000 square meters of lightable area and about 100 hectares of kind of um, unpermeable land or built over land. Uh, uh, it's so big that the sky scale of it uh, is a kind of a scale of a landscape. This is a shot of a forest that's been there before the park and uh, it's kind of we're standing in the forest and the, the forest not being very big but still it's um, much smaller than the smallest shed in this park where there's about 12 really large uh, buildings all serving um, German markets, German e-commerce or German industry. Um, this is another uh, building in the same region um, where a single field has been kind of just extruded 
um, into the shape of uh, about 500 meter long warehouse, which is not let out yet. So it's just been built as a pure speculation. And um, this, is, this is here where we started to consider the kind of peculiar relationship between the logistics and the land on which it stands. And that's why we were so happy to be invited to contribute as well. Um, because um, the site, there's something strange already in the landscape, even before the logistics development have, has arrived. The, the, the sizes of um, fields in the Czech Republic, uh, they're way more than, it's a, than what's a European average mostly because the agricultural collectivization in Czechoslovakia has been more intense um, than in the rest of the uh, socialist Europe. And uh, in these regions, in the border regions of um, Czechia, uh, the uh, collectivization would be even more intense. So while um, and in 1948, an average size of a field would be 0 0.23 hectares, um, today it's 20 hectares, uh, which is roughly comparable to the average size of a whole farm in Europe, while a typical size of a farm or a single agriculture company in the Czech Republic is now 133 hectares. So um, the scale is already somehow shifted and the logistics development is uh, somehow working with this as well. The total size of the city park work is also in this is roughly 100 hectares as well. And um, we thought that this relationship somehow manifests best when um, the uh, parks are in construction where the land is really revealed before it's built over uh, with pavement, with parking, with also quite a lot of landscaping. The developers are very careful to introduce uh, landscaping all, all around and within the parks. And um, this kind of strange relationship between the artificiality of the sl concrete slab of the warehouse shed and the differently artificial extremely large agricultural fields where um, nutrition is only added uh, with, uh, with chemicals and with kind of mechanical treatment. We, we just thought this is an interesting relationship. These are photographs from the book as well, which are taking, uh, having a look at the landscape, which is in the immediate vicinity of these parks, um, illuminated by, by the mostly parking lights of, of these storage sheds. Um, and uh, I hope this works as well. And again, when these buildings are in construction, it's, it's really then when you can see the, the scale of them and how when you introduce a flat platform in a slightly molding landscape, this kind of violence, which is almost um, uh, monumental um, and includes movements of incredible amounts of agricultural soil. Uh, really kind of speak about this relationship. Um, this is another map uh, from the book which shows the temperature, different temperatures of surface um, in the region. Uh, the darkest blues, of course, are uh, cities and centers of cities and towns, um, but the kind of slightly lighter blues are those of the park, like for instance here. Um, and then the still lighter blues are some of the fields, uh, some of the agricultural fields again. So it's just different kind of blue. Uh, it, 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 it's kind of a spectrum rather than a hard line. Um, and um, so for us, this is not really an excuse or is, this is, we, as in the article as well as in the book, we're trying to look at the kind of new layer that the logistic is, logistics is uh, uh, putting across the central European landscape as, as a kind of a, in the Anthropocene sense, a, a kind of additional, additional layer, um, which takes really quite incredible amounts of land, of agricultural land from us. Often it's the most uh, fertile land, um, but we do get some things back, um, especially now in the kind of um, COVID context, we learn to rely uh, to an, quite, um, spectacular extent on, on logistics. And, and we ourselves are also critical to our own project. This is the book that as it appears on Amazon website. So we're not, we don't want to be seen as kind of in this kind of activist position of just refusing the 
warehouse as a kind of alien entity. But what we are really interested in is, is seeing the, it in the context of what it offers and what it takes away. And in the case of the Northwest Bohemia, it doesn't really offer the region anything. It's it just takes advantage of its kind of continental location. Um, and um, I think that's 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 it. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, I think that's uh, my conclusion. Yes, thank you so much, Tadeas. Can you stop sharing so then Bojana Jan and the last speakers can actually close? Yes. I hope after this uh, kick up, we're back on track. Um, so thank you, uh, Romer, for the introduction. And thank you to Annie Latke and Tadej for the presentations. We're looking very much forward to the discussion, the discussion which is about to follow. Um, Jan and I will present our article, Chadak na nebu Zemi, or Castles in the Air, which focuses on a very unique architecture in the region of Lev Chapolya in the northern Bosnia and Herzegovina. This uh, particular region has a personal significance to me because it is, in fact, very close to my hometown. Uh, and it was um, a region that inspired uh, a lot of wonder when I was a child with its fantastic architecture, enchanted castles, making me feel like an Alice in Wonderland. Um, and so on. I think it acquired uh, a special meaning also when we returned together, uh, a Westerner and a local, and um, it kind of encouraged us to dig a little bit deeper to find um, a bit more about this unique architecture and the circumstances we also brought it about. So um, the present, I will present the, the socio-economic context of uh, these changes and this mutation, and then Jan will um, explain a little bit more in detail the, the case study, the history of the, of the region, but also the architectural characteristics which emerged. And finally, we will conclude briefly by reflecting on the um, consequences brought about by the construction of the new highway and the changes that it um, brought about in the region. So following the breakup of Yugoslavia and the declar declaration of the independence, um, Bosnia was um, torn by um, an armed conflict resulting in widespread devastation, loss of life and uh, herbicide. Um, paralleled was also this a new need for um, building of a new identity um, and also a newly acquired, often extra legally acquired wealth. So this set, a very unique set of circumstances was extremely fertile land for a very extreme transformation of built environment as exemplified in the Chaponia and seen in these first couple of images. So um, the causes of this transformation can be traced to the following three at least. Uh, the first is the need to annul the old socialist collective and Yugoslav identity and replace it by the newly constructed identity such as uh, which was more individual, national, and uh, capitalist. And uh, the second is uh, this was also this transformation was also a reaction to the economy of shortage following the life of scarcity, especially in the last few decades of Yugoslavia. The home ownership and the construction of the new buildings was uh, a, an expression of newly found freedom. And moreover, it was also means of empowerment, self-determination, but also expression, as I said, of this newly acquired wealth and social status. Finally, this uh, transformation is also embedded in the macro processes of migration and globalization. So this map shows uh, the countries in the Western Europe with the highest number of um, Bosnians living abroad. 
Um, I will I would like to draw attention just to the total number of uh, Bosnian diaspora, which is around two million. And what's perhaps even more striking is that a quarter of this number is in fact are in fact people who emigrated between 2013 and 2019, which goes to say that just that this migration and only consequence of the war and post-war year, but also the instability, which kind of and went on and on until the recent times. Um, the migration is significant for our research because it enabled um, replacement and merger of the local cultural references with those imported ones. And um, through importation of a new uh, construction materials, techniques and technologies, it merged the Bosnian and Herzegovina market into the larger global one, but also through creation of new demands, it expanded the local sectors. Um, furthermore, it's significant because the remittances, which are also go hand in hand with the migration, represented a newly found capital and sources of income. Again, just to reflect, the, the remittances today are around 11% of uh, Bosnian national GDP. And in the past four years, for example, in 1998, it was almost 50%. So this new techniques, new materials, access to new markets, but also the access to new capital enabled a special um, mutation of the architectural language, which is particularly striking in Leachipone, which is our case study. So I will now present to you the, the case study itself and show you some built examples that are very representative of the mutation that Boena just introduced. Um, Lev Cepolje is, um, is a region located in the north part of Bosnia and Herzegovina between Banja Luka, which is also the, the main city of the northern region, and uh, the Croatian border, which is uh, the, the first gateway to European Union and the, the rest of the Western Europe. Um, this proximity with Croatia facilitated the, a constant flux of uh, goods and people, among which a lot of people from the diaspora are going back to the country. Um, and in this context of a shift towards a free market economy and with the ever increasing movement through the region, the, the road became a, a, very, um, a very strong, economic opportunity for the whole region. Um, as a result of that, this region, which was traditionally mainly agricultural, became also um, a major transportation artery and, and drew people around it. Um, people changed their, um, their uh, economic activity uh, from agriculture to commercial activities. They became business owners, um, um, and often politicians also, um, with the, the whole region gaining in, in influence uh, on the national level. The, the architectural language followed this mutation, this social economic mutation, and uh, transitioned from a utilitarian to most, more exhibitionist style and uh, architecture, reminiscent of uh, some other types of uh, roadside architecture. The, the roadscape uh, that this, uh, this road represents in the city and in the, in the region underwent a very rapid and radical transformation and the whole territory became uh, a territory of consumption and pleasure, whereas it was before uh, mainly a, a, a territory of pure production. Um, on this uh, strip of around 50, uh, 50 kilometers uh, of the road, the driver experiences an eccentric slideshow of turbo architecture, um, a, a term coined by Ivanovich uh, Weiss um, to, to reflect on the phenomenon, similar phenomenon uh, in the in our Boston, uh, sorry, Serbian architecture. Um, during our field trips, we noticed two main um, typologies, which are worth uh, uh, talking about. Uh, it's also interesting to note that often these typologies mix into one another and create hybrids. Um, the first typology is the commercial building. It includes motels, um, uh, supermarkets, parking cellars, window cellars, gas stations, uh, restaurants, bars, and so on. 
they will compete with color, style, and shape to attract the customers from the road. And on the other side, uh, the residential um, typology sh um, is, um, is showing a lot of these fantasy-like castles with uh, vibrant colors, geometric shapes, and they, they also bring a lot of elements drawn from various references, sources, and um, also imported from various uh, places. They, they're also informed by the, the owner's very own experiences, personal experiences, as well as their own imagination and also architectural representations, often also imported from uh, the Western Europe. The, um, the use of material and of uh, the use of ornament is also representative of this, this new, newly, um, uh, this, um, this new uh, economic order of uh, capitalism and, and consumerism with the display of uh, some, some consumer symbols as, um, as ornaments. It all culminates in, in stylistic excess and do not aim to be authentic, but rather to, to display the, the owner's own um, uh, identity as well as the, the owner's um, trust and optimism for the future enabled by the, the new social economic order. Um, today, the region is facing a new stage of its transformation with the construction of the highway, or actually the, the soon, uh, the, the upcoming completion of it, which is, uh, it, it has actually been partly open uh, in 2011, but is due to be, to be completed very soon. This, uh, this resulted in a shift in the, in the flux through the region, and uh, also um, uh, a shift in economic dynamics in the region. It brought to a halt the, the recent developments, economic development in the region. As a result of that, a lot of businesses are closing down and the inhabitants are migrating to either the, the neighboring cities, regions, or even abroad. The, the extravagant villas are becoming economic burdens and remain either unfinished, uh, they're put up for sale, or they, they're just simply abandoned. As conclusion, we, we can see that the, the metamorphosis of this rural region of Lev Chapulia is, uh, and also the different level of completions uh, of the buildings is reflecting the political jamming as well as the inconsistent economic development uh, of the region. And so we very much see these buildings as kind of testimonies to this, at first, this very accelerated growth encouraged by the optimism of capitalism and democracy. And then at the same time today, their representation of this protracted transition time so instead of being kind of only symbols of optimism, they're also symbols of uncertainty brought about by the transition. And thus the, the new status quo is in fact this um, insecurity and instability, which became a new normal. So I think with that we will conclude and uh, I guess we can move on to questions and discussion. Thanks guys. Um, I have uh, kind of a general observation and, and also a question. I wanted to say that your photo series made me think of a term we use in the US and in Canada to describe a kind of similar recollage or mismatch of typologies. We call it a, a McMansion. And there's these kind of neoclassical Spanish colonial Frankensteins that are menacing the suburbs. You can see them pretty much anywhere. And, and like the houses you photographed, they really express the aspirations and desires of the inhabitants. Um, and I, I, that's what I really thought your series was about, that it was about buildings expressing ideology and identity and a lot of different influences. In your case, the aftermath of like this brutal civil war, whiplash, imposition of new democracy and free market economy. And I found it really fascinating that in the face of so much instability and uncertainty, that the aesthetics of the individual home rather than the commercial gravitated towards the castle. Right, because the castle is a fortification. It's something easily defensible, built in anticipation of attack. But there's also something really joyful 
and buoyant and hopeful in the color palettes and the sighting and the materiality of these castles. So I just wanted to say Castles in the Air was I think a very well, well chosen title for your piece. Uh, and then I wanted to position it in the context of Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi's Learning from Las Vegas or Robin Boyd's The Australian Ugliness. Like, are there lessons that we as architects can learn from something that initially presents as kitsch, especially where the, the architect probably remains anonymous? Yeah, um, thank you for your question. I thought it was very well placed. Um, to reflect just briefly, I think it's not so accidental that uh, the Mech Mansion is kind of your first association. I think, I mean, probably unconsciously was also a great inspiration for many of the buildings, this idea of capitalism, I guess. Um, the learning for Las, from Las Vegas was our, I mean, Bible is maybe too well strong a word, but it was definitely a very a strong reference from the beginning of the research all the way throughout. And if I may, I will just read a quote, which I, I noted down very early on. And it goes like this. There is an individual need for intimacy and detail unmet by modern design, but satisfied by five, eight scale reproduction in Disneyland, by the caricatures of human scale in the patios of garden apartments, and by the seven, eight scale furnishings of the fancy interiors in Levittown model homes. And I think this is perhaps nowhere as true as in, in, in post-socialist countries, such as the um, former countries of, the, of Yugoslavia, and also including, uh, of course, Bosnia and Herzegovina. I think here, the very well-designed, functional buildings of social modernism that aim to bring about equality. And I think Diana Milano also referred to, it, her, to this in her lecture in the, in the past lecture of the series. They actually did also succeed at this. But, and it was also, I mean, today, also this recent exhibition with Noma, it, it does have a great architectural quality as well. But unfortunately, they have not succeeded in addressing the needs of the people inhabiting them, and they fail to become intimate spaces and homes where people can, you know, really identify with them. So they, they became, they were, and they're still perceived very sterile, gray, uninhabitable, and impersonal. And as a reaction to this, this landscape of basically a burst of color and very flamboyant and very exhibitionist emerged. Um, and I think it's perhaps ironic, maybe, that um, while the, the architects, local architects and professionals and academics very much thrown at the, at the style of these buildings, they at the same time you know, use the same bricolage for the lack of local references, um, but perhaps with a little bit better sense of proportion. And I will conclude with just saying a few days ago um, in, in Zurich, actually, I attended a lecture called uh, On Irony, which was by, presented by Ten Studio and our colleagues, Irina and Natalie, and um, they basically um, question if irony perhaps could be a vehicle of um, reflecting on our, our practice as architects and perhaps replacing this obsession with pictorial to focus on the process of design and include the society in this process and their tastes and therefore perhaps practicing architecture as a collective act. Um, and I think this would allow architects to be perhaps more introspective and critical of what we do and to share a bit of our control, perhaps for a better diversity and to also be better able to respond to the needs of those who we're providing for. And I think while it's very interesting that this debate is happening in Switzerland out of all places, I think it's, it's a very relevant question we should probably all be asking ourselves and finding adequate answers to that question. I actually also wanted to ask a question to Boyana and Jan. Um, what, what's, it, seemed, it seemed that your essay in many ways is kind of about movement. Uh, it's about seeing the buildings from cars to the regions transform. It's all about, it's all about petrol in some ways. Um, and I was wondering, um, it's a kind of a twofold question. The, what, what about the, the populations of, of of this region? Is it this one stable part around which everything unfolds and transforms or is it 
is it changing as much? Um, and that's kind of in a historical sense, um, and but also in an immediate sense. Like, I think for example, if these um, Mac mansions, let's call it, uh, are um, so much about expressing individuality of their owners, what happens when the owner changes? Uh, is there another layer that's kind of takes place in uh, reinterpreting someone's expression of themselves by expressing yourselves. So this, um, oh, this, uh, if you can maybe say a little bit about yes, that. Yes, the question we, uh, we found is, um, yeah, notion of movement and kind of uh, temporality, very interesting in the question, but also in the region. Um, the history of Lev Cipolle, to answer the question, the first part of the question is similarly to the rest of the Balkans, very, very dynamic. Um, we had Austrian Hungarian rule, we had the Ottomans, there was then Yugoslavia, and now there's independence. So it, it shifted a lot. And these changes in governments and the rule had also a significant impact, obviously, on the settlements, the population, and the natural environment. Um, actually, to reflect on the natural side of things, before the the modern times, the, the whole region was covered by a very dense oak forest. Um, and um, at the beginning of the 19th century, it started being deforested and replaced by fields, which at the beginning and for most part were not really cultivated, like a small minority was. And the industrialization of this agricultural region was really during after the Second World War with irrigation and drainage only being done around 70s and 80s, so rather late. Um, in terms of settlements and population, again, the changes in this governance and rule also resulted in changes of settlement. And that not only, I mean, every time a ruler changed, they changed the names of the places. So we had the German and Turkish, and I don't know, um, Bosnian names, um, but also the, the very structure of the settlements changed. So they, was, they all had their own uh, settlement structure with the kind of over, uh, over, overlaid over the existing settlements. Um, and for example, there has also been a movement in demographic um, in the 19th century, the end of 19th century, there was a, a large settlement of Austrian Hungarian documented, but also there was, despite it being often very much populated because of the fertile land and um, the favorable conditions, it also was challenged by uh, depopulation. So for example, the town of Lepce, which was uh, how the whole region gained its name, was completely abandoned in 1865 due to very high taxes imposed by the Ottoman rule. Um, so the and then furthermore, throughout the history, the demographic structure pertaining to religion and ethnicity has changed a lot, culminating in the 1990s armed conflict and after. Um, and since the 1990s, the, the population of Lepchepoya has been in a constant state of flux moving either to the other urban centers within the Bosnia or to the other um, entity or abroad to the either neighboring countries or to the Western world. So the temporality which you noticed and I think which we try to talk about is also very much represented or best represented in the houses uh, in the region which uh, are often summer homes for the locals but also homes in their home country by those who left the country. So they, they're very much abandoned during the winter months, it kind of it becomes a ghost town. And then during summer, when all the people come back, it's very vibrant and occupied, or at least it was um, before. So, um, and with the changing of occupation of the inhabitants, that's another sense of this mobility, social mobility, where people move from agricultural activities, which I mentioned to being uh, businessmen and entrepreneurs, and also strikingly enough, politicians with local, regional, and even national influence. And um, the question about the houses themselves, th these are very often um, actually family endeavors. They're kind of generational homes, and they're very specifically built, which also makes them very difficult to be sold off later on. Um, and I think the current illustration of the movement uh, is this depopulation an abandonment, abandonment of the region due to the construction of the new highway. And somehow this, uh, 
this state of stagnation, abandon, abandonment, um, destruction in a way uh, that we documented, it, it's also kind of a witness of this changing, uncontrolled change imposed by the new highway. Again, this movement is, is symbolized also through that. Thank you. Uh, Brianna, thanks for that uh, answer. It was super interesting to hear about the seasonal change of those houses. Um, I also have a question, and you already tapped into it a little bit, but I was wondering if you see any potential in these houses and these structures, which are so individualistic, but uh, yeah, super interesting with this whole yeah, uh, yeah, system around it. Like, do you see anything that could go in one way or the other or change? Yeah, I think this is a very difficult question to answer because, again, they were built very specifically and the, the program, the site, they all represent something very specific for the family who built it. And also its extravagance in a way, it's, it's, it makes them very difficult to sell off. I think in the current socioeconomic situation, I think it's very difficult to find the buyer and especially the buyer who would identifies with the same style and program as the previous owners. So, yeah, I think um, we did think about this question on the move, but I think it's really difficult to answer. And I think we would actually ask for kind of rethinking of the whole region and what to do with the region as a whole rather, I think. Maybe there are some questions to another speakers because I, I believe we exist uh, Jan and Boyana. If it's um, if you have maybe you Boyana and Jan, you have a question. Now that we've been uh, grilled for a solid half an hour. We can return the, the questions. Uh, maybe we ask the first question to Tatesh. Um, I think in conclusion, first of your article, we mentioned that the local population has in this process of transformation managed to react and adapt. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more how they actually did that and how did this adaption look like? Yeah, it's, it's many different ways. Uh, it's maybe to start with the, the title of our, sorry about the sun, <laughs> the, title of, uh, the title of our book that actually is coming from a nickname that these one of the parks has in one of the small towns in its proximity uh, where a local pub owner has described this logistic park as a, a steel city that someone just placed to what before has been agricultural landscape and of which he has kind of nothing but um, trouble with the seasonal workers in his in his words so um kind of different groups of people would react differently to it of course this is always a major source of employment um, but what's interesting is that um, the, uh, the kind of offer many times exceeds what the local settlements can provide so uh, that just by definition because the scales and numbers are completely different um, so it does provide a certain uh, amount of relatively decently paid jobs for the locals um, it provides all kinds of uh, uh, of problems for them as well of which the main one is or and again in the kind of the words of the people that we spoke to is the um, it's generally half to half these uh, warehouses would have half uh, people just employed on the contract and half would be agency workers uh, well they're salaries would be lower than the contract employees um, and they would often also live in the locality or they would commute and these groups of people uh, would not always kind of uh, live or work together in the, in, the, in the ideal conditions and there's a lot of friction uh, of, of kind of both because just their, their financial situation is quite different and also because one is kind of stable local population and the, the agency workers they fluctuate they change constantly they move around um, so um, in um, in I, I would say in conclusion that the um, the um, 
it's, it's, it really differs a bit who, who you ask. Uh, and, uh, and uh, maybe the, it, 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 this is um, the, this kind of uh, status of the agency workers is really maybe the most problematic part of this whole phenomenon in, in, in West Bohemia, I would say. Thank you for your answer. And maybe just to move on in the same line of thought, um, we actually, it's a question for Lepke. I think uh, in rural Georgia, since its independence, um, there's been a, a serious problem with depopulation. I think um, the, the, rural, the rural population has often uh, said that it's due to the lack of infrastructure, including schools and roads and um, electricity and water. I know that uh, in uh, Svaneti, it's a bit different. But I was wondering if perhaps um, you noticed that through this uh, plans of construction of hydropower dams, especially in the case of the ones that are not constructed, obviously, if there's been any positive change that was brought about um, to the local population. Yeah, it's actually very interesting, the question, because normally investors come with big suggestions of improving infrastructure, investing into education, investing into uh, jobs, investing into the future of the valleys. And the problem with these cases is actually that they started building uh, and constructing roads and bridges, but because of this stagnant uh, process, because of the, yeah, the income, they're not capable of providing the proper construction plans, they're not able to provide uh, proper feasibility studies. So every time they come, they build a little bit and then they leave and they leave the garbage behind, they leave that their uh, unfinished projects behind, unfinished bridges, roads. Um, some of them are actually also built without sustainability uh, in, in the back of the head. They destroy more than they actually give. And on the other side, it also happens a lot that, for example, in the Nenska uh, case, it was the case that the construction vehicles came in and they actually destroyed the existing roads instead of improving them. And, they build also roads for their purpose. They don't build the roads for the purpose of the community. So they might not be useful in a way that they don't go to the places where people actually want to go and where they actually need to go. They might not fill in the missing links between uh, yeah, the communities and the Caucasus, which is so spread out. So it kind of fails to actually provide this infrastructure that the communities are actually needing to grow from themselves and to be more sustainable and more self uh, yeah, independent also. Yeah. Great, thank you. I actually have a question for Annie <laughs> uh, because I was really interested in, uh, in the rigidity of the grid you've been talking about in your article. And I was wondering if you see um, a big urge to change it or do you feel like that there is a way because it's covering such a vast amount of like, yeah. property uh, is there even a possibility to change anything or do you need to do we need to learn to work with it and use it in a different way to make it more uh, sustainable yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question. And I think particularly in this case, I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but the grid is many things beyond just the physical infrastructure, although that is very apparent in the policy making that I talked about, um, and also part of the foundation of the United States. But it's also ideological. It's a prevailing social norm um, and, and social practices, as well as an economic system. And so in the US, that grid is really tied to a mindset called uh, frontierism, which I'm not advocating for, but it really dovetails nicely with this kind of idea of American exceptionalism, but also neoliberalism. Um, and it's the belief that the singular individual can overcome setbacks, it's a meritocracy. And it's ultimately about growth and continued expansion, that the frontier is not just a physical space, but a mental space. And so I think the grid is about growth at a time when we should be talking about degrowth. And I think that the grid as an armature will exist as long as we continue to evaluate the success or failure of a project or land in the case of your story in a purely economic or productive term. Um, 
It's the framework of neoliberalism and the attention economy and the grind culture and all of those things that we deal with on an everyday basis. Uh, I, I said at the end of my talk, I wasn't sure if it was you know, a positive story or a pessimistic one, but as a result of my research, going off grid seems to me almost impossible, like to consciously drop out and opt out um, because the grid exists the smoothing and sedative effect. It will take anything and try and assimilate it. It's kind of like the Borg in Star Trek. And that's why the examples I've chosen are all accidents because it seems like anything done without intention doesn't bring the baggage of all of that history with it. Yeah, so could go either way. I also have a question for Annie, or sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was, I wanted to ask, it kind of follows what Lefke asked. Um, because the your your story kind of had two parts. It was the grid and it was the desert, and I'm really interested in the desert part um, because I find some common ground with with our research as well. Is because um, it seems that the desert kind of offers a certain kind of openness and also incentive for growth, uh, very much like the grid. And it's almost as if the desert is a, a space that's already been built over somehow, or it's somehow less natural. Uh, and things that wouldn't be allowed in a natural environment are allowed in the desert. Um, and then in our, in our case, in, in the case of mostly the, the kind of contemporary critique of, uh, of uh, industrial scale agriculture in the Czech Republic, desert is sometimes mentioned as this kind of a warning of where the soil is going to if nothing stops. The, the only thing that will be left is a kind of a mechanical carrier of artificially added nutrients um, and um, so that's kind of one part of the narrative and the other part of the narrative is that the agricultural uh, land already is a desert uh, so it doesn't matter if we build over it um, it's kind of both, both are very extreme but um, so uh, it's not a very clear question but I just wanted to you to, to encourage you to, to, to elaborate a little bit on the kind of potential of the concept of a desert is it understood or is it is it spoken about yeah, I, I think the desert is concept is a really interesting question because I think particularly in the US in this example, the geography plays such a huge role, right? The grid completely ignores it. And so on one hand, the desert is seen as a challenge that any pixel of that grid could be made with enough water, something that could cultivate and grow crops and made productive. Um, there's also this saying that's often misattributed to um, Mark Twain, like so many sayings on the internet, which is that uh, whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. And I think that what that's getting at is that in the desert, the real question is about water. And water is many, many things. It's alluring, it's the promise of salvation, but it's also deeply political. And so as a result, water rights, are one of the most bitterly contested um, fights in, in the Southwest. Um, and it's also the land, so, so on one hand, it's a challenge. We can make this land productive. But on the other hand, it's also the land that no one wanted. It's the leftovers of the Homestead Act. It's wound up in the hands of federal agencies to manage it. And I think that there's something appealing about that, about something that is, unwanted or left behind. Uh, the desert draws, I think, really extreme people and extreme solutions. So the area that I was talking about um, in the Imperial Valley, just a little bit north of that, the desert is littered with art and outsiders and people on peyote trips and this kind of leisure and escapism that parallels this landscape of subsistence and survival. And this question, I think, what you asked about deregulation, that the desert is seen as a place where anything is possible because no one is there and nobody wants it. Um, during your presentation, I saw many parallels with the Tahoe Reno Industrial Center, which has a number of very large fulfillment centers um, and the Gigafactory is under construction. I'm not sure if it's been, been finished or not. 
But there, the reason that those fulfillment centers are placed there is because of lack of regulation at a state level. So that's where they're testing self-driving cars and that kind of deregulation there and in Southern California attracts, I think, a, a certain kind of mentality or, a, you know, the, it's still the Wild West. But I think if I could flip it back to you now that I'm done talking about uh, the desert, I was very interested um, in fulfillment centers as a piece of architecture, I think because they're buildings that aren't intended for human habitation, right? They're buildings that are intended to store goods or in the cases of some of these Amazon fulfillment centers for robots and machines. Uh, so when I first heard your lecture, I had assumed that the reason these were bad for the surrounding environments is because they were not job creators, right? That a lot of this work is or will be automated. And because so many of these decisions are being made based on the technology we have at our disposal now, like how long someone can drive in a day, I'm wondering how you see these future kind of fantastic tech proposals by companies like Facebook and Amazon, um, whether it's drone fulfillment or fully automated fulfillment centers. No, that, that's really interesting. Uh, thanks for asking that. Uh, because um, this is where this kind of map of performances in Europe comes back again. Because uh, what really matters is that the wages in the Czech Republic still are still low enough to make it more profitable for a human to do the the kind of mechanical tasks like gripping and moving things around the shelves literally uh then it is to to use robots uh, in the amazon in in prague there is one robot they don't really use it <laughs> there, there is thousands of people uh what they uh, so there is many people in these in these buildings thousands of people well uh, what they use instead and that i find really scary to be honest is that there is a lot of kind of automation going on in a slightly different way to these kind of high-tech fantasies of like Elon Musk and uh, and Amazon uh, and that's um, yet that people use all kinds of uh, on wear, wear on electronics I think it's called or it's kind of on body gadgets like a headset and like little rings for, for scanners and um, so there is um, this kind of there, there, there is not too much skill that you need to, to do these uh, warehouse related jobs, the lowest paid ones, um, but there is some and even those are kind of taken by these automation systems. Often what you would see is that the headsets would be in language of well, the worker and so the workers wouldn't necessarily need to even speak the same language, the workplace. So um, the, the, the kind of bodies their, their bodies are not replaced. It's not profitable enough, but the skills are replaced. So it's this, one of the things this, this means is that it's extremely easy to, to start working there. You, you just come, you get the headset, and then after one day, you're able to, to do the job. That means that by definition, your job is really precarious because anyone can replace you at any moment. Um, so this is a slightly different path than what you kind of often see when the when architects speak about logistics with, with robots, everything's automated and people are, are gone. Um, so that's maybe one of the things where this, thing, this phenomenon, which in many ways is universal, is kind of specific in, 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 our, in the region that we looked at, I think. Yeah, so until we reach the point of full automation, we're asking the human body to be optimized, right? We're asking people to behave more and more like machines rather than implementing the machines. Yeah, and, and it's, sorry. Oh no, it's okay, I'm, I was curious. So one of the reasons for citing of the fulfillment centers was distance, right, to urban centers. And I'm wondering if one of the other things taken into account is exactly what you mentioned, which is what minimum wage is, what the labor, labor force can offer. No, absolutely, and it's very, very, it's very precisely quantified with this kind of capability, and this is, I think, even the phrase, the, the gripping capability of the human hand. It's, it's, it's very difficult to to match that with the robot because of different sizes of things. And this, and this is, you know, this is the simplest thing that we can do. And when you speak about automation, you, you imagine, you know, that the 
this kind of uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, doing everything. But in, in the end, you know, we are gripping stuff and an artificial intelligence in our headphones is telling us to, to go to shelf number 35. Uh, I had a question also, it kind of taps into what uh, Annie said. Um, and there were two things that were kind of also similar to the hydropower developments in the mountains, like in an abstract way. Like the, you talked in your presentation about this monumental buildings as these warehouses and the fascination about this architecture and this landscape. And also you said you try not to say you're against or, or for it. And I think it's just really intriguing this kind of um, position of uh, distance of trying to come with a neutral neutral position and taking distance to the project saying oh it's fascinating the monumentality uh, this idea of people working together but not having to interact what kind of society is art created through that but i think um in uh, in my uh, research i always looked into how can we actually uh, reduce this distance to these projects? How can we reduce this, uh, how you say, um, it's not personal, so it's a little bit detached. How you can, how can you re re like reduce the detachment to actually also criticize the bad things and actually be aware of, could we maybe change these things? Because I think you have to be somehow a bit personally involved in actually suggesting changes that might have, um, in impact in one way or the other. And I was just intrigued, what did you take away from uh, writing this book? And what did you take away from writing this article and digging more and more into this topic? Are you still so distant? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, th thank you for asking. We, we kind of, st we started with the distance, I would say, it's, it's a fair thing to say. Uh, and we wanted, we, we kind of thought where we were gonna map things, we we're gonna look at sizes and densities and distances. Um, that's kind of what we do. And then um, as we were kind of getting more involved exactly as this distance when we physically visited the, the places and talked to some people, um, we, um, we actually in the book also, we quite openly say that to that one form of the logistics industry that only takes the land and kind of outsources storing of, which is the lowest added value part of the supply chain to, to kind of foreign markets that we are very critical of that, very critical that really brings nothing to, to, to anyone except the, the developers and, and the, the, the companies that outsource this. Um, um, so this is kind of, a, this is literally what the, what the reducing the proximity, proximity meant. Um, on the other hand, what we also don't want to go for is um, we would often hear this um, this kind of or people would often assume when we spoke to different people for instance local politicians that we want to somehow make these places nice or change them to maybe a little bit better and then we that we also from the beginning said that that's just not possible because this is so this it's not the problem you know if the, if the sheds are a bit nicer or if they are they're the, by the way, they're very sustainable by all the standards, sustainable by all the standards of, of REM and um, all the, they've got all the certificates. And actually one of the major develop, developers has partnered with, I think, I'm not sure if it's REM, I think it's REM as a kind of a partnership of two companies. Um, so we didn't want to go this way either, like trying to improve it architecturally because this is just an ex expression of how the kind of supply chain works at the moment so we, we again as architects we we don't dare to or maybe not in the book we don't dare to to say okay well you need to transform <laughs> transform how capitalism works that's kind of implied maybe but uh, never said um, so uh, this is just this is just how things are and this is this, this is one of the places where you can physically see how things are and how, how uh, our contemporary economics work. And this is really, for me, interestingly, also this is 
where you can see the difference between the kind of 60s, 70s kind of capitalism, uh, the kind of corporate one, and then the, the, the one that's been with us the past 20, 30 years, the supply chain one, which is very different. And in many ways, uh, it puts a lot of the pressure on the people that in those localities. And this, this kind of example of removing the skill and removing the security of the job, this is exactly one of those things. Um, so yeah, we, we're quite critical of certain aspects of it. We don't wanna, it's very difficult to say warehouses are wrong because you need to store things also, but uh, I'm not sure <laughs> this is, uh, if this answers your question. No, it does. It's uh, it does. So maybe a little bit uh, as a concluding uh, uh, the question and also reflecting what has been said because actually as um, as you thought as you were saying uh, the things they are like like that and the only thing as an architect maybe to secure the wages but to like put it as uh, maybe to outline it in maybe more pragmatic way as the question because as we understood the large infrastructure bringing let's say high employment like keeping let's say in that that matter in Radeja. but ha however as Boyana said most of this maybe not as you said in Switzerland but in Central and Eastern Europe uh, that kind of settlements are lacking social infrastructure higher education so kind of you limited your possibilities or opportunities yes as you work in that you are really how you say you kind of you really attach and you are really in the, uh, dependent on that um, let's say um, capitalistic aspect which is like really that private company sector so with this mind because this leads sometimes to the risk which sometimes uh, as we were st studying let's say mono towns now it's becoming like uh, mono villages yes which you have one function and then where uh, business uh, declining that is also uh, affect uh, let's say larger part of the uh, society yes with the unemployment where they were not protected or they didn't have protection in their retirement or like longer social security so in putting this more in positive let's say not positive but trying to understand how to tackle further base maybe with the mind based on your research and also observation working maybe with municipalities or like talking to people like have you been exposed to any policy or regulation which are trying to negotiate with the private sector actually long-term benefits to bring to this context. Because as I had the possibility personally, I work in Chromadas, which is like smaller scale settlement last year within Connection School. What was the lucky the most, this lack of negotiations, uh, skills, and also the tools that they were not designed to host this dialogue. So maybe as you all like if you can maybe bring some examples maybe not exactly from that research context which you had article but another which kind of trying to tackle that scenarios or like that that's that kind of uh, problematics maybe if i start since i've been speaking a lot and then and i'll stop uh, I, I think what what we were trying to, uh, without trying to not answer your question, <laughs> I think what we were trying to to do with our book is um, we kind of as architects often have this kind of urge to go and do stuff <laughs> straight away to, to improve things <laughs> when we see a problem, and uh, I think there there is there is something about and it's this is common to to all these uh, to, to all the projects really or to, to some of them is um, some of this is quite new in, or of course there are precedents of it but in some ways it's new and uh, it's not we don't really understand what it is and what it does and you can uh, I, I personally don't know what's how you can approach what's the best way for instance in terms of the negotiation the kind of disproportion of the, of the developer who can choose from any site anywhere along the highway or even beyond it and this one village which just has the village it's it's just the negotiation is just so disproportionate that it doesn't it it, it doesn't it, it doesn't make too much sense to even start with it or i'm sure you would disagree but then uh, so i would i think first we need to kind of understand what what what, what is going on and, and 
theorize a little bit. What 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 is this a symptom of before you go and do things? That's also very valid, and people have been doing it. Uh, you know, to, to research by design, things like that. But um, I think our stand was to just stop for a little bit before we go and do things. Could I uh, jump in there? <laughs> because I slightly disagree because I feel like it's not a new problem. It's just a different kind of uh, case study or every one of us has a new case study, something very contemporary, but it has always been a problem that people sacrifice land or property or their livelihoods to uh, bigger problems. And um, not bigger problems, but bigger developments. And it is, I'm sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, I mean, it comes back to lots of big developments back in the days already. I mean, if, even if we go back to the Roman Empire, we know it has been happening. Uh, and it has been happening in every kind of uh, very powerful system. It has been happening in communism, it has been happening in capitalism, it has been happening in fascism. and. This is why I struggle with saying, oh, you have to look deeper into it all the time. We have to digest every single little bit. And then actually there's a new problem already. So what do you do? And I think it's all about realizing that any kind of system that becomes too strong might cause these problems. And then one has to position himself to this kind of phenomenon, I think. It's not really giving an answer of what to do or what's right or wrong, or maybe you might even like these developments, but I think it's uh, yeah, important to recognize that this has already been happening. Um, I, I'd like to say, oh, um, well, I think in all of these cases, we've been documentarians, and in that way, we wanted to bring a little objectivity to it. But I also want to say that like we as individuals are not limited by our job and our job description and how we enact change and how we make policy changes. We can vote, we can protest, we can choose how we spend our money. And I, I just want to add that as a little, a little caveat and a PS because I think it's, it's easy to get bogged down here with the sort of um, almost a demand by the profession for moral ambivalence or objectivity but that we as individuals are capable of taking a stance. Yeah, I just wanted to reflect on the, the remark uh, made by NFK. I think it's right that uh, the, the question of time um, and the question also of scale is really important in this, uh, in this discussion because like, the, the question of time is everything is going so fast and evolving at such a rate that when you when you start looking at things then it's already the problem has already changed as you said and seems to be in all those uh, all actually all lectures today every time it's a there is a, a very massive uh, but either by accident or by uh, another other factors a region suddenly develops itself uh, in a very striking manner very rapid manner and it seems for the case of the Salton Sea uh, area, or in our case, uh, and that's the question could be is, would it be also in the case of Czech Republic and this area of, uh, of logistics? Maybe in, in, in five years or 10 years, it's not relevant anymore. And it's, it would have moved somewhere else and maybe even at a, at a larger scale. And the, the problem, <laughs> and the problem would have already changed and would be even greater and more complex and more, yeah, even more larger scale. So, and yeah, the, the question of the original question of Romea um, about, it, I guess, the, this question of uh, uh, action uh, or uh, reaction to these processes is really difficult when they get, they, they get made at a larger and larger scale. And I guess the reaction and the time for people to first understand, do we have time to, to reflect on it already or not? And then if you if you have the time then to unite people to to make people agree on, on a solution or uh, simply to get people to talk together i guess it's it's already yeah long past the time to to react actually yeah, and at the same time i think the yeah developers or investors 
when I work with the different stakeholders in my current job quite often, and it's really difficult. It's a lot of work, at least in Bosnia, in the context that we have to, as Jan said, bring people together and really encourage them to kind of really kind of talk for themselves and raise their voices and say what they want. I think that's the thing. I think in Bosnia, it's very common that people will complain, but very rarely, and it takes a lot of effort to get them to say, okay, this is what we think is better. And I think it's really, at least for me, I don't, I don't think that I can propose a solution um, regardless of my background or knowledge. I think it's really difficult to do so. So unless they um, tell us what, what, what is better or what they would need as a society, I think it's really difficult to reverse that pattern and change it. Maybe, can I just add, I kind of feel like I've, I've been abrupt because I don't disagree with anything that was said at all. Uh, it, and of course, it's amazing if you go and, and do change things, uh, if you can. Uh, I, I guess what I was trying to say is that this, this was just our personal choice to kind of just pause for a little bit, just ourselves in this one case, and um, try to read things instead. And while I was kind of making this statement just a minute ago, I, I didn't even mention that in the book we do describe kind of positive ways to, to respond to, uh, to, to this phenomenon. Like for instance, the, or this kind of situation of uh, disproportion that I mentioned before, that the, the, some of the municipalities uh, tackle it by kind of coordinating along the, uh, along the infrastructural corridors. That, that kind of often form families of these logistics part. So there is, for instance, one which is called Corridor D8. There is an article about it in the book, which is just describes how the different villages and small towns along the highway kind of coordinate and have a common strategy which prevents the developer from going to the town just on the other side of the municipality border. So uh, I just wanted to, you know, to, to make this clear with, with, without to not sound like a fatalist reader of the world's changes that don't want to <laughs> add anything to them. Okay, thank you so much. I think because we are already like almost two hours, I would say, uh, over time, but th the most important, thank you for your contribution, uh, for sharing with your research because this is actually really interesting actually to compare different analysis and research on the context because as we understand we face similar aspects so kind of uh, not inspired but also kind of uh, as you were saying building awareness and knowledge on that problematics that uh, as fast as they are as they are progressing there's a certain aspect how how fast are we able to react but the aspect of exposing that knowledge and let's say conclusions are really important. So thank you so much, especially contributing for your connect, to the Connection Magazine and uh, taking your time. So uh, thank you again and uh, have a nice evening. <laughs>